Democrat Jasmine Crockett represents the 30th Congressional District in Texas, and she's one of nearly 80 new members of the 118th Congress. She told C-SPAN about an experience with racism in college that drew her into a career in law and public service, and about her professional life before running for office. Um, so I'm a practicing lawyer. So I've been licensed to practice in the states of Texas, Arkansas, and federal courts for the last 16 years. Um, and I know when most people think about lawyers, they think, is this the person that sits at the desk or do you go into the courtroom? And in short, I was a courtroom lawyer. Um, civil rights work. So for those that have been watching as the big police brutality cases have happened, I have usually represented the family members of someone who maybe was killed. Um, I've also represented uh, anyone all the way up to capital murderers or accused capital murderers, because I do have uh, a few people that did not get convicted. Um, in addition to doing what we call personal injury work. So basically, if somebody's in a car accident and they need to sue the insurance company, I'm the girl that goes to court and sues the insurance company. And you did that for how many years? So licensed and practicing for 16 years. And what did that teach you about yourself and prepare you for coming to Congress? So interestingly enough, it's the law that actually drove me to want to write legislation. Um, I was the girl that would walk in and say, this doesn't make sense. How can I fix this? And living in a state as large as Texas with 30 million people, 254 counties, um, you know, you think about it and you're saying, I'm walking into one courtroom with one case. I need to fix this for the collective. Um, and so that is what drove me to run for the state legislature, um, where I served as a freshman and then I ran for Congress. Um, but it was my experiences, the real life experiences, that I just didn't really feel like lawmakers understood how these laws were affecting everyday people. And I wanted to go in and basically let them know, this is what happens when you do this. Um, and I, I thought it would be valued uh, in the Texas House. Uh, we, you know, uh, not necessarily uh, is how I'll put that. Um, and there's a former ambassador who talked to me when there came an opportunity to run for Congress. And he says, listen, you stay in Texas and you really won't get very much done. Not what you want to get done for your constituency. Um, you will be in a deeply red situation, a red house, a red Senate, and a red governor's mansion. But you have opportunities on the federal level. Even if you go into the minority, we know that things actually change on the federal level. And that's where you can really be a champion for your community. And I thought about that, and he, he was right. Um, and so I decided that this really was a good opportunity. Was there something or someone in your early years, maybe as a child, that triggered that interest in civil rights? Honestly, no. Um, so my parents weren't the marching type of folk at all. Um, it was my real lived experiences, some of the scary things that I've seen and some of the conversations that I've had to have with um, some mothers um, that really made me say, I need to do this. Um, the very first time that I even, I guess, thought about it was I was uh, in college. I attended college in Memphis, Tennessee at Rhodes College, the same school that uh, one of our justices uh, <laughs> attended. And I was the victim of a series of hate crimes. Um, and so it was, it was the first time in my life that I had ever experienced racism. Um, so I definitely understand those that think that racism doesn't exist because if it's not a part of your reality, it's easy to say that it doesn't exist. And so here it was, I had gone to um, a number of schools where I was in a significant minority. I never really felt that way. Um, I just had my friends. We weren't you know, caught up on color, so to speak. And when I got to college in Memphis, of all places, I never really thought about racism there either. And there was some idiot uh, we never figured out, or a series of idiots, not sure, never figured out who the culprits were, but they started keying our vehicles with the N-word. Um, they put together what looked like Jack the Ripper letters and put them into our on-campus mailboxes. And uh, there was a lawyer from the Cochran firm that was brought in by the school to investigate. And it was the first time that I said, man, you know, who helps people when they feel this way? And while we never got to the bottom of who did what, it was the comfort level that I got to see her and to know that she was there 
to be my champion. Um, and I think that, that that definitely initially piqued my interest. But by the time I got to law school and they told me I could actually make money, I thought, oh, great, great. You know, I, for, I forgot. Um, but through a series of experiences and growing and maturing, I did some soul searching and said, why did you ever want to be a lawyer? And it took me back to that moment, that moment of how I felt to be so vulnerable and helpless um, and to be discriminated against simply because of the way that I was born that made me say, I need to get back to my roots of why I ever wanted to get into this work. And it sounds like that's why you're here today. Absolutely. Same thing. It's just a matter of how can I make this world a better place for those coming behind me? Um, I look at it and say, you know, I'm only here because there were people that were willing to risk their lives for an opportunity that the Voting Rights Act be passed, the initial five-page Voting Rights Act that was signed into law by a Texan, Lyndon B. Johnson. Um, Texas has a rich history of doing decent stuff. Um, when we look back, it's unfortunate that so many of the monumental things that we have stood on in this country actually were born out of Texas, and unfortunately it's Texas that is trying to take us back to um, a time before then, even Roe v. Wade. Henry Wade was the district attorney in Dallas County. The, the criminal uh, district attorney's office sits in my current district. Um, Sarah Weddington argued that case successfully as a classmate of my predecessor, Eddie Bernice Johnson. They were sworn in to the Texas House 50 years ago. And on that House floor, this young woman who was still in her 20s, only a month into her service into the Texas legislature, gets a call from the Supreme Court. And so Texas is why women have reproductive rights in the first place. Texas is why African Americans and other minorities um, have been saved from some of the Jim Crow relics that existed as relates to voting. Yet Texas is also the same state that led the charge in making sure that they were going to spread what I consider to be a cancer throughout this country um, when it came to rolling back women's rights on reproductive health, when it came to rolling back access to the ballot box. And so I think that it's time for Texas to rise up um, and for people to see who the real Texas is, and I believe that I represent who we really are as Texans. Did your predecessor give you any advice? Oh my gosh, tons. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know what, the, the one thing that she said, uh, because she did call me and ask me to run for the seat, was that she wanted somebody experienced. And uh, there's over a 40 year gap difference in our age. And people kept saying, she's a little different from you. And I'm thinking, you know, there's a, gen a few generations um, difference. But the one thing that she said was, always keep the people first. Focus on the people. And that's just who I am. She wanted someone who had experience, but she also wanted someone who had a heart for the people. Um, and so those are really the two things that make up who I am as a lawmaker. Those are the things that I'll continue to carry with me. And if for some reason this job becomes um, something different from that and starts to turn my heart, that's when I know that it's time for me to go. Let's end on a lighter note. Some of your colleagues have said you have a profession <laughs> elsewhere. And it's not true. And that's singing. <laughs> so if you don't mind. Oh, no, 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 no. Favorite song. Oh, OK. Um, favorite song. And just so maybe sing a little bit oh, from it. Oh, no, no, no. We're not going to do that part. But uh, I, I don't know if I have a favorite song. but. You know, I'm a Texan, so I always got to support Beyonce. Um, and, and one of her songs has been a theme for a number of my campaigns, and even right now, um, and that's Lemonade. And so I tell them, we may have been given a, a few lemons, but we are going to make this a lemonade session. We're going to add some sugar to this as Democrats, and we're going to turn this thing around. Um, but I am the child of a preacher, and so I have always sang in the gospel choir. You're just required to when your daddy preaches. Um, so, you know, I know how to blend in with other people. That's what I know how to do. 